don't know, Skype, whatever that is. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's that computer. So, you know, I didn't Yeah, do so we don't know what it is. Someone. <laughs> yeah, someone made Skype, uh, whoever's computer this is. But I, I can handle this. No, nah, just, leave, just leave it down there. It's fine. As long as these keys work. Okay. I don't, I don't, I, we don't have to deal with that. I, don't, I just like to push the button. Yeah, I don't think it's, did a, no, it's this, did you copy this to the computer? Did you, is it running from the drive? Or did you copy it to the computer? No, it's in the computer. Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. And uh, sorry for the late, I was like, making a progress. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Benjamin Leader from Wilson University. Benjamin is one of the most outstanding researchers in the field of ecological materials. He already won the Wilson Diana Scholarship when he was a bachelor student. Then he did his case in his name, who is the father of the, of the field. And now he's doing a postdoc in the group of uh, anthropology and PSD. And uh, today he's going to talk about uh, the politic of the administrator. Okay, thank you, Maya, for the introduction. And again, I apologize for the delay and the technical issues. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a new phase of matter that we discovered in the past year, the topological Dirac insulator. And so this talk is structured as follows. First, I'm going to uh, um, First, I'm going to talk about uh, a review of fermion doubling theorems uh, in the context of condensed matter, and specifically how these no-go theorems relate to quantum criticality, uh, and how you can think of them as giving bounds on the kinds of topological insulating uh, phases and behavior that you might see. From there, I'm going to lead into a discussion of crystal symmetry, so we're going to do a little bit of point groups and algebra for the representations of these symmetries, and then build up to wallpaper and space groups, and even something called non-symorphic symmetries, which I'll introduce. And then we'll show how you can use an understanding of this from a group theoretic perspective um, to constrain the kinds of bulk topological features, or the kinds of features you would see on the surface of something that's a bulk insulator. So there's a relationship between topology in the bulk and geometry on the surface that we're going to explore. And finally, I'll show how that allows you to find this new phase of matter, this topological Dirac insulator that has this fourfold degenerate surface state uh, with very unique properties. So, uh, in condensed matter physics, people talk a lot about fermions, the hourglass fermions, wild fermions, stuff like this. So what does it mean? So, you know, in crystal systems, you have bands, the energy bands, the function of crystal momenta, and occasionally they can touch, and so you can have a metal if the fermion energy intersects them, but sometimes they touch just in points or lines. And so when those points disperse linearly, um, you can say that the low energy physics for them res resembles, you know, the equations that you see in particle physics. So some of the simpler systems that we're first seeing, like graphene and sort of bismuth, you say, okay, this looks like the Dirac equation. Um, and if I don't think too, and if I don't worry too much about things like Lorentz invariance and my company tilting, then I can make a pretty good analogy between use things like Klein tunnel when you talk about it. Uh, and that, that worked pretty well for a while. Although, and then recently there's been this whole field about exploring how the Dirac equation and the Lyle equation don't cover everything. But the main point is you can really think of these things as fermions and but by the same collection of symmetries that protect them and properties of chirality and wild points, it turns out that the low energy theories of these things also have the same bounds as the fermions um, in high energy physics. And so this leads to kind of fermion doubling theorems realized in condensed matter systems. And so these theorems, sometimes referred to as no-go theorems, they, they provide bounds on the kinds of phenomenology that you can see in condensed matter physics. And so basically what they are is a relationship between the geometry of your system, whether it's some 2D or 3D system, whether it's, um, whether it's periodic, like a crystal, uh, whether there's some set of symmetries that protects these points, and whether there's any you know, close-by topological features. And the point is that if you somehow are cheating one of these theorems, and you see people talk about, like, oh, I avoided the nielsen unit -Nielsen theorem, I did stuff like this, um, they're really breaking the rules in some way. Sometimes it's subtle. But by identifying specifically the way in which you're breaking the rules, you can get a better understanding of what are some other ways to do it and some new phases and properties that you can realize. And so examples of these things include the most common one is the nielsen yamiya theorem, which says for any chiral fermion, which is something you only have in odd dimensions, because you, can't, you don't really have a sense of handedness or chirality in an even dimension, so usually 3D. Um, you need to have a net zero chirality in the wrong zone. 
you can imagine taking slices in 2D and measuring some insulating thing. And as you come around, you find that you need to come back to yourself because the Veron zone is periodic. Um, but there's other Fermion doubling theorems that show up. There's the Fermion parity anomaly, and this governs two-fold degenerate, two-dimensional fermions. And so this is something that relates, as we'll see, to quantum Hall points or critical points, and it shows up in the honeycomb, the Howley honeycomb paper, so you can explore this uh, 1988 paper, maybe nice discussion of it. Um, and then there's this sort of more recent, subtler thing about Dirac fermion parity, where here I'm talking about Dirac as a fourfold degenerate point in two dimensions, like those in graphene if you count spin. So, briefly to review, um, two-fold degenerate linear fermions are doubled in condensed matter for a variety of reasons. There's an argument that says if I have one of them and I take a loop around it, then the very phase of that loop is pi. But, you know, you and I could have disagreed on the direction of the loop. I could have said the loop is this way, and that the phase inside is pi, or the phase outside is minus pi. And, and so you might worry that if I, that there's some disagreement, because if I were saying there's a single fermion here and no fermion out here, then how do, how do I get pi being minus pi the same if I had some like pi reversal symmetry? Um, so, and the resolution is that if the bronze zone is compact, then if I take a loop around one of them, then if I have a fermion inside and a fermion outside, then whether or not we agree on what the inside of the loop is, we both get a very phase of pi for the two regions. Um, and this is sort of maybe not the best way to get into it. So a more concrete way to think of the same constraint is to imagine writing down a... So imagine, like, I have a system where the low energy physics is entirely governed by a single two-fold degenerate linear fermion in two dimensions, given by this Hamiltonian. So I could, I could say that if n equals zero, the system has time reversal symmetry. And then I could imagine breaking time reversal symmetry, and because it's only a single out mass term, and then the two phases on either side in some sort of domain wall type construction are topologically distinct. And furthermore, because the gapped phases lack topological symmetry, or lack time reversal symmetry and are in two dimensions, I know that they're quantum Hall phases um, with an integer difference between the quantum Hall invariant. But this leads to a bit of a problem if this were the only fermion in the system uh, that had time reversal. Because the constraint that I had time reversal symmetry protecting the critical point also requires that the two sides of this transition are related by time reversal symmetry. So this says that I get this equation that minus c has to equal c plus 1. But I also have this constraint that c has to be an integer for the topological phase to be stable. So I have a problem because this thing seems to only carry a half integer Hall conductance. So the resolution is that this, this low energy theory can't describe my entire healthy system. So I need to have another fermion somewhere if I want this thing to be a stable theory. And so how might one imagine getting around this? And so one resolution is you could stabilize it if you put it on the surface of something and connect the bands coming from it to some sort of bulk manifold that were to stabilize this in place even though it wants the gap on its own. And so that is how a three-dimensional topological insulator works. A topological insulator is something that, like the top and the bottom surface, each of a single two-fold degenerate linear fermion, but, and it's stable, but you could imagine taking just the top and the bottom combined 2D system, and those each have a single fermion, but the combined system has two, so that it still obeys the parity anomaly successfully. Um, and so the topological insulator is this phase of matter that was recent, for those of you who don't know, it's this phase of matter that was fairly recently discovered. So the 3D version is predicted by Fu and Kane, uh, Kane being my old advisor, Charlie, uh, and various versions of bismuth selenide. And then it was observed only like nine years ago or so. And the, the point is that they, if you run an RPEZ experiment or you look at the photo emission on the surface, you can find this odd number of Dirac cones, which is sort of the smoking gun for this thing. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that the, the Nature paper where they, where they discovered, where they observed this in the selenide is called a topological Dirac insulator. Um, although people don't use this word Dirac to describe it anymore, they just call it a topological insulator. And so I'm sort of bringing it back, but, in a, but meaning something else by it. Um, but we'll, we'll get to the distinction in a, in a second. Okay. And so what I mean by Dirac point in this talk, and for the paper that this talk is based on, is a fourfold degenerate linearly dispersing fermion. So if I think of a two-fold degenerate linear fermion as something that lives at a quantum Hall transition, 
then it turns out that the fourfold degenerate linear fermion lives at a quantum spin hall or topological insulating transition. And so this is an important distinction because graphene, if I add some, some spin orbit term, though weak in practice, is, becomes a two-dimensional topological insulator keeping time reversal symmetry. And so graphene, the four-band graphene, has things that I would call Dirac points and things like sodium bismuth and things that I would call Dirac points, but the things that live on the surface of a topological insulator I would call something else, like a two-fold degenerate commerce pair or something. Um, but this distinction is important if you want to talk about the kinds of uh, phases that you can get by gapping these things. So this four-fold degenerate Dirac point, I can imagine writing this Hamiltonian, and what you find is that you have to introduce additional symmetries to stabilize it. So if I want to keep time reversal, I have to also add crystal symmetries of some kind. So here, I'm representing it with P being inversion symmetry and S2I being some sort of rotation, some complicated screw rotation. Don't, don't worry about it because at this point, the idea is that just these are unitary matrices and this is an anti-unitary operation. And they constrain this Hamiltonian to have, have linear terms proportional to four time reversal odd matrices. And then I know that because all these matrices that I commute, the dispersion as this is just Kx plus Ky. So it's linear. Um, but um, the, I could imagine adding a mass one that breaks one of these symmetries and anti commutes with all of these, and then I would gap this thing out. So let's try adding the term tau z, which breaks the screw symmetry and keeps inversion symmetry. And then I could play the same game where I imagine I have a 2D system where this fermion is the only stable point. And so what I find is that as I gap it, the two phases are, are topologically distinct again in this construction. One is a topological insulator, one is a trivial insulator. But again, I have the same problem because I have this extra constraint that these two phases are unitarily related by um, the broken symmetry. However, it's well known that the wave functions of the topological insulator are quite distinct, the wave function and the YA functions, from those of some trivial insulator. They don't have an atomic limit. And so, what you can also say by looking at the more formal construction is that the two phases cannot be related by the unitary transformation. So this is not a healthy theory. So what there is, is there's also a form of Dirac fermion doubling. And that is in a 2D crystal, in terms of also in a 3D crystal, I kind of have a single symmetry stabilized fourfold degenerate Dirac point. I get a three, but I can't have one. Um, and as long as I have time reversal symmetry, this has to be true because of the relationship with the quantum spin hall effect, with the topological insulator critical point. So what I could do is if I have a system that has two of these things, then they each have an individual mass term. And it's unfortunate here that the, that the, that the axes of this figure are sort of a linear combination of these. But the idea is that now when I act with a broken symmetry, then I mirror about the horizontal or the vertical, and so I take a TI phase to a TI phase, or an I phase to an I phase, and the idea is that now in a system like these two things, I could act with broken crystal symmetries and still have a well-described healthy low energy theory. Um, so this is a, like a crystalline version of the parity anomaly. And the whole point is that I'm relying on the symmetry that stabilizes the critical point to provide constraints on the kinds of, and the, the sort of number of stable critical points that you can have in a low energy theory in a Brown zone. So there's a, you can ask the same question. This is a question that my advisor, uh, Carly, would ask me for a long time. Is there any way to form a sort of topological insulator that has this as a surface state? And in some way it cheats this double end theorem, the same with the TI, like 10 years ago, cheated the parity anomaly. And it turns out that the answer is yes. So you, this is what the topological Dirac insulator that we found last year is. So topological Dirac insulators are new topological insulating phase of matter with a fourfold degenerate surface state. Although it doesn't look like graphene, it's a non-degenerate cone. Um, and the way we got it is kind of interesting, also kind of dumb. We were just exhaustively looking at all the sort of 2D surface symmetries, and what we'll see is that if you knew all the sets of phenomena that you could have in 2D, you also know the kinds of things that could ever be stabilized on the surface of something, and there are not that many, it turns out. And so as we're playing around with this, it became very clear that there was a, that there was a distinct way of rearranging bands and some non-somorphic systems to get a new topological insulating phase that satisfies uh, the sort of cheating of Dirac from the double. Um, and so to properly understand it, I think the way that I got into it, we're going to talk about the kind of crystal symmetries that lead to this. Uh, 
very lightly I'll do an introduction to group theory, uh, time permitting, but I'm really trying to keep it light uh, on the group theory part. So I encourage you to read more about it, but I'm going to do sort of a very basic introduction to kind of the symmetry algebra intuition that leads to this. So basically the starting point is, in two dimensions, I have some degeneracies on the surface, and what I can show by some knowledge of sort of low symmetry features is that there are no, basically there are no bio points in two dimensions. So these tables that tell you when you have some sort of topological feature that maybe goes beyond the kinds of things you get from irreducible symmetry representations or the things that are characterized basically by symmetry eigenvalues, more or less. And so what you can find is that if I take a 2D system, and, and we're always talking about classical <coughs> symmetry, so particle hole symmetry is crap in real materials, and uh, usually we find strong spin orbit interactions. So the idea is we're working in class A2. So we have universal squares to minus one, so in this column. And then we're looking at 2D systems where we're taking a loop around something, and we're trying to ask whether that loop is quantized, in where the Hamiltonian living on the loop lives in class uh, A2, more, more or less. And the idea is that, that in two minus one dimensions, A2, has a zero, uh, and so there's no low-dimensional way of doing it. And I can also do this by saying this Hamiltonian, depending on the, the way I want to say 2D inversion, I could say class A also has a zero in two minus one dimension. So either way, it's healthy, and, and you feel confident that there is no special topological connectivity, that all the features I see on the surface of something are, are either given by crystal symmetries or time reversal symmetries. And so that really allows us to rephrase the question of what, what I ever see as a topological service feature as what are the allowed um, band features in any two-dimensional system. And so a simpler question is what are the allowed band features in a zero-dimensional system? And so really what you want to ask there are what are the symmetries of molecules? And so I could take this very simple molecule. I have some equilateral triangle trimer no translations, it's really characterized just by anything that returns it to itself in the same location. And this thing has some symmetries, it obviously has threefold rotation. But if I consider it 3D in the sense that I can mirror about the surface normal, then it also has an additional symmetry of rotating by half of that. So, so we use this language that the CN rotation is 360 degrees over N, so C6 is a 60 degree rotation. So I can do C6 times inversion, or inversion is I flip all the coordinates, and this thing comes back to itself. So this is called an improper rotation, because it's some rotation times pulling the thing through itself. So I have a C6 roto inversion, or an improper rotation, and then I have a mirroring about the x-axis, and then I also have some rotation um, about the y-axis, like this. And so the point group of this molecule is generated by a six bar and two. And so using that information, I can talk about the kinds of degeneracies that, that are required in a Hamiltonian that governs this, governs any model of this molecule. So if I started with some system with weak spin orbit interaction, I was talking about Hamiltonian uh, spinless things under there. Then the idea is that I, if I had some time reversal, it wouldn't know about electrons, so it squares the plus one. And this is the usual classical particles. Um, and then I have twofold rotations that commute because you know, I, I can take objects in real life and go like this, go like this, and then go like this, and go like this, and then I get the same object back. Um, but then I can also ask the same question, what happens if I have sort of strong spin orbit interaction, in which case, as I do this, I'm dragging around half an inch of quantum mechanical spins, and so now my rotations get a minus sign, my time reversal gets a minus sign, and my rotations don't commute, because the generators of this rotations for the half an inch of spin can be considered like Pauli matrices. So they have this sort of Clifford algebra. And so what that tells you is that you know the minimum degeneracy of your Hamiltonian. For those of you who work with group theory, this is like the minimum size of the irreducible representation or co-representation with time reversal of this point group. So, or the projector perhaps in case space. Um, so the idea is that I can look just at the symmetry algebra, and then knowing that those symmetries all commute with the Hamiltonian, I know the size of the, the minimum size of the matrices that govern this, and because the Hamiltonian has to go as the identity, I know that all the energy eigenvalues are the same in this minimum construction. 
So, for example, if I have two unitary symmetries with H and an anti-commute, then you know you can't represent them with numbers because numbers don't anti-commute. So then, then H must be at least two by two. If I have a time versus symmetry of H to squares to minus one, Converse theorem says that H has to be at least two fold degenerate. And then you can build on this. So it turns out that if I have two unitary symmetries in that commute, a time versus squares to minus one, and commutes with them, and at least one of the symmetries squares to plus one, you can prove that now I need to have four by four matrices to characterize this. So this is typically, um, for anything with two-fold rotations, the kinds of algebra that protect Dirac points. Um, the Dirac points you see in, in sodium bismuth and cadmium arsenide, you see three and C4 symmetry. So it's a little more complicated version of this, but it's the same point that you need a four by four matrix to accommodate the algebra of the symmetry. Now you can even keep going. It turns out that you can require six and eight-fold points. And people call these things new fermions, double Dirac points, and stuff like that. Uh, but they're quite rare. And so at this point, to find them, you're better off just looking at what's allowed in all of nature and then seeing if you can figure it out the other way around. But uh, I mean, this, this game you can keep playing as long as you place the constraint of could it ever be realized in a real system. All right, so then I can extend to a crystal. So I add translation to my elements and I form some collection of points, and as long as my translations and operators have some sense, then the points eventually repeat, and I have some regular lattice that I can talk about uh, using blocks theorem on. And then I get to be careful about what you've done, really. And so if my points have a sense of, my points internally have some sense of dimensionality, maybe they have mirrors about the normal, maybe they just have in-plane operations, so this I would call the site dimensionality. And then my lattice, I can have you know, periodicity this way, periodicity this way, so there's some lattice dimensionality. And so this defines, and so the collection of symmetries that governs the system is called a group. And so depending on the dimensionality, you get some space group or something like that. And so in 3D, if all my sites are 3D and all my translations are 3D, I get a space group, which is what you usually hear in these correspond to perfect 3D crystals. If I have a 2D lattice, but maybe it's buckled and I want to use the third dimension, but I'm only periodicity in two dimensions, this is governed by the symmetries of a layer group, which is a subperiodic group, and it uses 3D symmetries with two periodic dimensions. But if I want to talk about something that's truly two-dimensional, I'm going to talk about something called a plane or wallpaper group. And this is the symmetries of a piece of wallpaper that I can tessellate a wall with, but keeping knowing which side it is out. So like the inside is glue or something dirty, and the outside is like a nice pattern, like wrapping paper. And it turns out that there's not a lot of wallpaper groups. You can go on Wikipedia, and there's a very nice article with all the pictures throughout history, like a thousand years of wallpaper that people come up with, all these intricate patterns. But you find they all have a very limited set of symmetries, because you <coughs> mathematically you can show that there's not that many symmetries that can be accommodated in a two-dimensional crystal. Um, and so we're going to use that later to find that we can exhaust all the possible topological insulating phases of surface states. But to understand the more exotic ones, you have to realize that some of these symmetries are not just cannot just be understood by, by an analogy to the point group symmetry. Some of them contain essential translations. So I may have some symmetry that, um, that people call non-somorphic. Probably you should call the group non-somorphic and it's a glider or a mirror, but the idea generally is that you have something like this. I have some chain that's buckled, for example, and you know these two live in the lab in the unit cell. This is my lattice vector. And so if I mirror about the y direction and I half translate about the x direction, that is also a symmetry of this system. And so this leads to basically bands that have to get stuck together because my Braun zone is intrinsically folded by the symmetry. And so without time versus symmetry, as I fold it, the crossing point can occur really anywhere. But if I fold it with time versus symmetry and strong symmetry order interaction, I get this pattern and tangle of four bands that looks uh, I guess David Vanderbilt called this butterfly, and if you look at half of it, Andre calls it an hourglass. Um, but this is just a feature of a non-somorphic symmetry, and so if I have time versus symmetry, it turns out that that requires two bands to stick together by commerce theorem. And if I have an additional two-fold non-somorphic symmetry, then I get up to four bands sticking together before I've done anything else. Another way to think of that is the eigenvalue of this has some k-dependence because of the half translation. The eigenvalues are four pi periodic so that I don't have a healthy description of a single one of these bands in a two pi periodic run zone. So the bands have to cross, so that I'm never able to say I have just a glide plus band. I always have some crossing so that you and I might disagree in which run zone is plus and minus, but we'll never disagree that one of them is plus and minus and that they cross. 
And so to talk about 2D symmetry is you want to talk about the wallpaper groups. And these are the things, basically, if you want to you know, use your sense of three dimensions to describe them, they're the symmetries that preserve an interface. So I have one material, I have another material, and then I have the interface. And so I can mirror in plane, but I need to keep the materials on the sides of the interface that they're on. And so I can rotate them, I can translate, I can mirror in the plane, I can glide mirror in the plane, which is an optimal operation, but I can't rotate like this, and I don't have spatial inversion or mirror about the interface because that would flip the inside and the outside. And so there's not a lot of symmetry. So these groups, 13 of them are symmorphic, and they have just these two band tangles and some trivial phase. And only four of them are non symorphic. And so you could exhaustively look at the minimal band class uh, connectivity in these non symorphic groups pretty quickly. And so before we get into it, basically it's good to review what are the known kinds of topological incidents before we started this project. Well, there was the constant Hall one that we talked about, the Z2 topological insulator, and so this is seen in business cell and I. And there turns out to be a mirror churn topological insulator. So if I have some wallpaper group with a symorphic mirror, there are Z ways rearranging the bands, and so something like saying polyurite has surface states that are protected by some mirror eigenvalues. And then even last year, Andre's group found that there was this hourglass insulator where I have some very exotic connectivity where I use this hourglass and I make some pattern of bands that goes on forever as they lies on the bulk, but has the whole sort of hourglass sitting in the middle. And but you can, and these are all you know derived using a fairly complicated set of formulas, but there's a more simple intuition for the way these topological invariants work. You could you could imagine taking the bands that you knew about in trivial phase from group theory. You could rearrange them in a symmetry allowed way to make an infinite pattern, and then you can ask the question, is that infinite pattern compatible and stable in a bulk insulator? And so if you do that with the quantum spin all phase, something let's say wallpaper group one, my only my only symmetry is traversal and translation, then I only have two options. I close the bands like this, or I make an infinite zigzag that places one fermi on each surface, one twofold degenerate fermi. If I take a mirror line, there are z-ways, if I were to color these things with mirror eigenvalues, a mirror ring the band, so this would be the mirror trend number. And then it's more subtle, but relative to the other bands, there are four ways of moving a single hourglass. I can have it here. I can have it here, where it connects like this, which is the hourglass insulator, up to a mirror trend number. Or I can make some sort of quantum hall phase out of it, where I choose one of the two ways to color the zigzag with the glide eigenvalues. So that covers all the wallpaper groups with uh, one glide or no glides, but there's two left. And so these wallpaper groups with two glides, PGG and P4G, I could take a look at the band structure in light of everything that we've done so far. So we see that along gamma bar, X bar, where these surface time reversal and varying momenta, I have hourglasses. Along the other lines, I have a local Cromer's theorem, so bands are twofold degenerate by the same statement as before. Uh, and then at the corner, at n bar, the glides and I commute squared plus one in terms of their reduced well representations, I reverse the squares to minus one, so I get a fourfold degeneracy. And so a typical band structure for the surface bands, not topological, looks like this, where I have a fourfold point, twofold degeneracy, and some hourglasses, but I have a gap here. And so the question is, what if I try and rearrange this and stabilize it in a 3D insulating bulk? And it turns out that you can do that, and you find that there is a way to do it where you stabilize the fourfold degeneracy sitting in the bulk as the only feature. And so this is a phenomenologically new topological insulating phase. People have published 70-page you know, papers talking about classification of the wallpaper groups. But you know, then they write this K theory, Z4 across Z2, Z8. But none of it is phenomenological. They don't, they don't discuss that all of these things are either these three topological insulators I talked about before, or this new topological insulating phase with its own uh, characteristics. So the point is that by looking at the band structure itself and arranging it, you can find that this is a, a qualitatively new topological insulating phase. And so why should you care? One, as before, from a theoretical perspective, is the first thing that cheats Dirac for me on doubling. Uh, the same with the TI, so we cheated the twofold degenerate linear uh, fermion doubling. As we know, that it's the final way of rearranging surface bands and getting a topological insulating state. So, all topological, insulated, topological insulators with high reversal symmetry 
must be one of these four phases of matter as long as it has surface states. So this is up to everything that maybe isn't a second order TI or some more complicated inversion protected system. Um, and finally, it turns out that these systems have this additional property where I can add a term to the surface and gap the surface state while keeping time works asymmetry, which in some sense you think ruins it as a topological character. That's the whole point of a topological insulator is that I can't gap it. But here I actually get something very interesting. So I could imagine sprinkling disorder on the surface, and I know that this disorder is going to mess up my glides, but it's going to keep time reversal that's not magnetic. And so you could imagine if it's random, uh, that it's going to induce pockets that are different signs of the single mass term that's allowed. And these surface regions, because the surface by the bulk, the 3D bulk topology is pinned at a 2D quantum spin hole critical point, become two-dimensional topological insulators with 1D topological helical domain walls between them. So the point is that the edge of the edge, so uh, the edge of the 2D region of this 3D material is a topological 1D state. And so these domain walls are, have been shown previously, because it's a quantum spin hole domain wall network, to be lutting our liquids. And so this is a way, and that their intersection is effective quantum critical point between two two-dimensional topological insulators. Ah, sorry quantum point contact between two 2D TIs. And so this would be a way of measuring some of the lighting or exponents, some of these switching behaviors and, and, uh, and universal scaling functions. And so what's nice about this is people try to rig this up in binary graphing, and I did analysis of it based on this paper by Affleck and Parmacanti. But when you try to do the experiments, they're highly sensitive to disorder because you're just relying on the idea that uh, it's a letting your liquid up to the fact that value is a good quantum number. So any disorder that mixes the key points in graphene totally ruins this. But here, these are protected only by time reversal symmetry. So these are true topological 1D modes. And so, um, basically, the topological invariant for this thing is quite complicated. Uh, there's no reason to get it rather than throw it up here and say that it's based on this Wilson formu formulation that involves a many band generalization with polarization. If I have bands that are stuck together like an hourglass, I can't separate them and say I have the polarization for this band and the polarization for that band. So I have to take the whole chunk of them, integrate, and then worry about separating the eigenvalues in some way and coloring them with glide and stuff. But it turns out this matrix of polarization eigenvalues has the same symmetries as the surface states. So we might as well just talk about the surface states and, and the connectivity of them and understand that it, it's really talking about some integral of the buried connection in the bulk and, and really is quantized. Uh, but this heuristic picture of rearranging the surface bands <coughs> is formally equivalent to it, up to checking a few things. And so it turns out that, as I said before, each glide has a Z4 index. And so the whole thing is a Z4 cross Z4 classification of the surface bands, but not all of them correspond to a bulk insulator. Because if I have some overall spectral flow, and time reversal symmetry, something's wrong, so it means there's probably a bulk wild point in the middle. So it turns out that I throw out half of them, and get this collection of eight insulating phases, and I can show that it reforms, that it obeys the algebra of the group Z4 cross Z2. So double glide systems have a Z4 cross Z2 classification, but most of the phases are phenomenologically familiar. I have the trivial phase, two hourglass phases, four quantum spin hall phases that are only distinguishable in some sort of special ARPES or domain wall construction. Uh, because again, it's the, it's the ways of coloring them these glide eigenvalues that are four pi periodic. So you might worry about that they change from bronze zone to bronze zone, but you know, bronze zones are the same in a crystal. Um, but I have one new phase, which is this topological graph insulator, the 2 2 phase. And so if you go through real materials and calculate this Wilson loop, coloring the things with the glide the same way we colored it before, we find that <coughs> striding a web even though it has, it's the metal, but it has a well-defined bulk gap, which has electron and hole pockets. If I calculate the Wilson loop, I find that it very clearly matches this 2-2 pattern because I can uninvert these two bands along gamma x bar. And if I calculate the surface states by wireization, there's a projection of the bulk gap at m bar. Inside it lives the highly localized on the surface, fourfold degenerate new surface state. Uh, and it's nice because this was found by an undergrad in Penn quantum chemistry who was doing this as a summer project. So you had all these postdocs working on this and doing all the theory and no one wanted to sit down. And he just gave this guy a stack of like 400 materials and then he ran it for his whole summer and he found one. So like, you know, the whole thing works because of him. And I don't even know if he, 
<laughs> like if this is its main interest. But anyway, so to conclude, using an understanding, understanding of 2D symmetries and how they constrain 3D bulk topology, they've exhausted all the generic topological features that can show up in a time reversal symmetric crystal. And so doing, we discovered a final topological insulating phase, a topological Dirac insulator. This thing has several desirable properties, and it's an exception to a different fermion doubling theorem. So it sort of completes the set of allowed crystalline exceptions of fermion doubling and systems of time reversal symmetry. It has a very special surface domain wall network and acts, allows robust access to letting liquid physics. Uh, it exists in some form of previously synthesized material. If I make this thing, I could, I could measure with ARP as the surface state, though it may be buried in some bulk bands. Um, and so there's some very nice directions I can go. Uh, one, certainly we're working with chemists to find better materials for the realizations of this family right now. We only simulated things with a tiny number of atoms per unit cell because it becomes computationally difficult. There are probably better materials in chemistry that are just worse in EFT. Um, we can extend this analysis to magnetic groups, though. There is a tremendous number of magnetic wallpaper groups, and so we could imagine rearranging the bands in such a way that I get some exotic crystalline magnetic flow and seeing if there's anything interesting there. And I could also imagine extending it to some sort of additional sort of edge of edge type construction. So to conclude, uh, I want to, I worked with a lot of groups in the process of doing this. So I started at uh, the University of Pennsylvania where I got my PhD only this past December. So Charlie Kim is my thesis advisor, Yanko Kim did the DFT, Daniel Kim was the undergrad who found the material, Andrew Rapp was the DFT uh, PI. Uh, then I did a stint at Nordita as a visiting scientist over for the first part of 2017, so I want to thank Sasha Blasky for hosting me. Uh, and then my friends and collaborators in this paper are now co-workers at Princeton, Barry, Jack Nono, Zijun Wang, and Andre. Uh, and then I want to thank Maya and the DIPC for hosting me for these two weeks. It's been really great, and I'll be back in July. So thank you. Uh, good question. Well, I had to impose a symmetry to have a the fermion double I'm not theorem. Criticizing. I'm not criticizing. I'm I mean, the, only asking. Yes, of course. You need just. I mean, this is what answer is. <laughs> this is how we have it. Oh, you mean? Oh, wait. Well, you mean the peri? You mean the original peri yeah. not, the, not the drag peri? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point. That in condensed matter, there's there's ways of doing this that you can't do in particle physics. So it's the question mm -hmm. of the rules. So as soon as I put on a lattice and I have a Brillouin zone, or I have some dimensionality, I mean, then again, I think you can still do it if you make it the surface of something in some higher dimensional construction, like these wild points, these 40 Ti kind of things. So I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not exactly sure that, that you can't do it in particle physics by a similar, similar construction. But certainly you cheat with the lattice. That's definitely true. Yeah. That's yeah. My question. yeah. That's how, I mean, it's not a mystery. It's not no, I said as long as you define your rules, it's okay. okay. Yeah. So in your conclusion, you mentioned the interplay between the 2D symmetry and the 3D topology. Yeah. So I'm trying to relate what I know about the simple case of the, the, the mirror chain number. Yeah. So there it seems to me that it was a 3D symmetry that is preserved at the surface. Yeah, so it's the project it's the set of bulk symmetries that are allowed to be projected and preserved on the bulk surface. Ah, so it's something like that. It's something like the mirror. Yes, yeah, so the point is the wallpaper groups contain the symmetries that in a 3D bulk that can survive on a 3D surface. Yeah. And if I may, a follow-up question was, the other thing I know about the mirror chair number is that, uh, so you mentioned you have a complicated topological invariant. Yeah. And my question is, uh, can you relate it somehow to the axiom of theta coupling? So in other words, is E dot B preserved by our protective symmetry? Like it is in the near term number, so that you can relate the thing. So, I mean, you get, there are versions of it that are strong topological insulators, so certainly there's definitely a way to formulate that. So, because the Z2 invariant is connected to it, so I can get the Z2 invariant by some exponentiation of these Z4 cross Z2 indices, um, and that's connected to the theta. So, my guess is probably yes, but it's a relatively recent formulation. So, it hasn't, 
it may not have been worked out to my knowledge in that explicit way. Thank you. Okay,